Well, good morning, everyone. May I add my welcome to that which has been given already, and it's just great to see you all, all out with us this morning. We are into now the, we come to the, the last topic in our biblical relationship series. It's marriage. We're going to be doing two sermons on marriage. This is the first one. Uh, marriage is an important theme in the Bible. You, you've probably noticed if you read any uh, amount of the scriptures, and it's an important practice as well. And so it's important that we understand what marriage is. And for us, that means understanding what God says it is. It doesn't matter this morning what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God has said. And that's a really important note for us to start with, because it's going to be a difficult sermon for, for many this morning, I, I think. None of us have treated marriage perfectly. None of us. Whether we are married or unmarried, we have all mistreated marriage in some way, whether it be with our bodies or with our minds or with our attitudes. And so some things may strike close to home for some of us this morning. So what we must do is realize we hold fast to the written word. We let this be the guide, the line by which we measure our practices and our hearts. We let the Bible inform our hearts and our practice. So that's what we're going to be doing in this first of two sermons on marriage. We're going to be developing a brief uh, theology of marriage, what the Bible says about marriage, what God has said about marriage. And then in two weeks' time, after the mission weekend, we're going to be looking at how we apply that theology in the marriage relationship. In our reading here from the uh, beginning of chapter 19 of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is asked about marriage. He's asked about marriage. Now, it's a different question to the one we hear these days, mainly, isn't it? But at its root, it's a question about the very nature of marriage. Look at verse 3. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? But how does Jesus answer them? Now, this is really informative for us. Because Jesus doesn't just give a yes or no answer. He doesn't even just go to the laws about marriage and divorce. Rather, he does something greater. He takes them right the way back to creation. Let's look at his answer in verse 4, beginning in verse 4. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And therefore God has joined together. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. In these few verses, Jesus answers their question by laying out a theology of marriage. He, he says what marriage is. And only after that does he unpack the implications for those who are asking questions. The Pharisees ask, what can we do with marriage? How, how should we view it? How can we treat it? How are we allowed to use it? And Jesus says, well, first understand what marriage is. It's a God-ordained, one-flesh union between one man and and one woman for life. Treat it accordingly. Here Jesus gives us a theology of marriage, and it helpfully, for a sermon outline, breaks down to four points. <laughs> Let's look at them. First of all, it's marriage is God-ordained. The Pharisee's question is, at its heart, can, can I end marriage for whatever reason I want? And so Jesus begins his answer by reminding them who made marriage. Who does it belong to? Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them, who made them male and female said? When you're asking about marriage, remember it's God who has said. And so we see two things here. One, marriage is not a man-made institution. And two, 
It's not the result of or response to the fall. It's not a man-made institution, and it's not a result or response to sin entering the world. It's what is sometimes called a creation ordinance, meaning it was ordained at creation. Along with every atom, animal, plant, and planet, God created marriage in the beginning when all was good. It is foundational to the universe. And we're going to see in a bit that it's because God had a plan for marriage from the very beginning. He had a plan. A plan with two emphases, the picture and the promise. God made marriage in the beginning with a very specific purpose. A purpose that was known, planned, and ordained before the fall, before sin was ever on the scene. And what this tells us is that marriage is not a concession for sin. Marriage is inherently good. That's not to say all our marriages are perfect, but marriage that God has given is good. Unlike other things, which we think of as good and important, and rightly so, but for example, sacrifice. Sacrifice wasn't there in the beginning. Sacrifice was necessitated by the fall. Sacrifice is a response to sin. Now, of course, it's important to have a theology of sacrifice. And as important as that is, we can say that sacrifice is not inherently good because it involves death. It was made necessary because of sin. Marriage isn't like that. Marriage isn't a response to a fallen world, but was ordained in paradise. It existed before sin. And so unlike sacrifice, marriage isn't about bringing us back to God. It's not redemptive. It's about telling us how the world was always meant to be. If man had never sinned, if Adam had never eaten the fruit, there wouldn't be atonement, but there would be marriage. Just think about that. If nothing else, it tells us that there is something significant and important about marriage. And because of that significance, God takes it very seriously. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Marriage is God-ordained. And not just the concept, but each marriage. Because marriage matters it matters how we treat every marriage because when a marriage has taken place God has in the definition we're talking about God has joined those two people he's joined them and so we better not mess with it marriage belongs to God it was made by him and each marriage belongs to him That marriage is ordained by God gives us a foundation for the rest of our framework. It is the qualifying attribute uh, that enforces the other three points we're going to see. It is ordained by God, and so that informs how seriously we are to take the following attributes of marriage. So it's ordained by God. Secondly, marriage is ordained by God, and it is between one man and one woman. We read here, therefore, a man, singular, shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, singular. In many ways, it's just as simple as that. It's just as simple as that. There's, that's what the Bible says. That's what God has ordained marriage to be. And there's not a ton of exposition to give here, is there? It's, it's quite straightforward. That said... You don't need me to tell you that as simple and as clear as that truth is for the church, there has been significant debate and disagreement over the definition of marriage in our world, particularly in these recent years. There has even been some claiming to speak for God, claiming to speak for the church, claiming the name of Christ, who have said that the biblical view of marriage as being between one man and one woman only is old-fashioned and only belongs to the Old Testament, and that Jesus doesn't address the issue. Well, here he addresses the issue. 
And he, he addresses it by invoking the pre-fall nature of the ordinance of marriage. Before sin entered the world, marriage was between one man and one woman. The practice of marriage to include unions between members of the same sex or between multiple partners only happened after the fall. So whilst there's not a lot of exposition to be had here, there is a lot of confusion about how we, as a church, are to apply this. And so let's just make a distinction here between biblical marriage and legal marriage. Two marriages. There's two marriages. In all of this debate, which is going on out there in the world about the redefinition of legal marriage, I believe that Christians have perhaps wasted a lot of time and energy politically opposing something which has nothing to do with biblical marriage. The way I see it, biblical marriage, that we talk about the redefinition of marriage, biblical marriage hasn't been redefined. It hasn't. Because how can man redefine something that God has ordained? They can't. The government can't overrule God's clear declaration of what marriage is. What they can do is create their own marriage. And that's all they've done. And truly, that's the way it's always been. There exists in this country two marriages, or at least two marriages. There's lots of different faiths that would have their own marriage that that they wouldn't recognize ours and we wouldn't recognize theirs. But two marriages in our mind, there's the legal marriage, which is sanctioned by the government, by the state, which is available to any two adults who desire to enter into a legally binding contract with one another and which affords that couple benefits that are not afforded to non-married people. And then there's biblical marriage, which is a God-ordained, one-flesh union between one man and one woman for life. Biblical marriage is ordained by God. Legal marriage is ordained by the government, and it's best left to the government to carry it out. All of this is to say that the government has not redefined marriage, don't worry. They've just created something new. You see, by ferociously opposing gay marriage offered by the state, we are confusing the issue, and therefore confusing the world about what we believe. We are not, or I dare say we should not, be against same-sex couples receiving legal and financial benefits from the government. Why would we be? There's nothing in Scripture that says that we should receive that. When we oppose gay couples receiving those state benefits, we just come across as angry bigots. Let them have the same legal rights and benefits, and if not, take them away from heterosexual couples too. Let their partnership be recognized by the world. Fine. We have no control. Let it it receive worldly benefits and rights, but we can be clear and we must be clear that it can never be recognized by the church as a marriage and it will never receive the spiritual benefits of a marriage. And there we must be concerned. Let's not get so tied up fighting everything out there that we forget our base and we forget our foundation. They may have taken the word marriage, and that may grind our gears. But unless it is a one-man, one-woman union, it is not recognized as a marriage by God, or therefore his church. Any legal marriage between two members of the same sex is not a marriage according to Scripture, and therefore does not come under any of its commands or instructions or blessings for married people. One other thing that needs to be said in this is that in saying marriage is between one man and one woman, that doesn't mean it's for every man and every woman. In Genesis 2 verse 18, God says, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Not, it's not good that the man, the man, should be alone. Now some people have taken this verse out of context and have applied it to mean that it's never good for a man or therefore a woman to be unmarried. 
And therefore, it must mean that the gift of marriage is better than the gift of remaining unmarried. Now, we've already seen a few weeks ago that that, uh, Paul has kicked that view into long grass, hasn't he, in 1 Corinthians 7. So what does God mean here when he says it was not good for the man to be alone? Well, he's not actually talking about marriage here at that point in Genesis. Not yet. God does not say it is not good for the man to be unmarried. He says... It's not good for the man to be alone. And we made clear two weeks ago, didn't we, that those two words are not interchangeable. Unmarried people are not people who are alone. They're part of this family, this church. We've addressed this, haven't we? That's not what God means here. Unmarried people are not alone. They are in a family. Adam, Adam was alone. The male sex was completely alone. There was an upper world of angels and a lower world of creatures, and yet there was nothing that shared the same nature with Adam, the same rank as he did. There was no companionship for man. There was nothing else that was made in his likeness. He was truly alone. So Genesis 2.18 isn't a statement about marriage, but about male and female. Now, The male sex would not have done very well without the female sex. And this is why I have a script, because I'd make a really sexist joke right now. I'm not going to. But one of the reasons, the top reason would be that Adam by himself can't produce more little Adams. It was not good for Adam to be alone. And honestly, we, we need women, men, don't we? We do. We need women. Yes, Eve, the woman, was also to be his wife, mainly due to the fact that they were the only man and woman on planet Earth. But Eve, the woman, was first created to complement Adam, the man, before she was to join in union with Eve uh, uh, as Eve, the wife. So first she was made Eve, the woman, for Adam, the man, before she became his wife. Man needs woman to compliment him. <laughs> not like compliment him. To fit well together. I mean, that's nice, but that's not what, what I mean. But to, to work well together. Yeah? And this is exemplified in marriage, of course. But it's also true of the church. Whether you're married to somebody or not. And it's true of the world. Men in the world need women and women need men. Men first need women and then men need women wives if they're given god says it is not good that the man should be alone and in the following verses that follow in genesis 2 we read about the creation of woman that happens and the woman having been made to compliment man and to compliment him where he's lacking and in need and vice versa and then we come to the point where marriage is instituted now that we have now that god has made two complementary sexes we read therefore So because we now have a man and a woman, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Marriage could exist now because there was a man and because there was a woman. But it does not mean that it is good for every man and every woman if God has not ordained it. Go back three weeks and listen to our sermon on on singleness, on being unmarried. If you're confused with what I've just said, it's all there. Marriage is a God-ordained union between one man and one woman. But what sort of union is it? The third statement that Jesus makes is it's a one flesh union. Look at verse 5 of Matthew 19. Therefore... A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Two individuals enter into a covenant relationship and in entering into that covenant relationship they become one. Where there was two, there is now one. Which in the marriage relationship is displayed primarily in the act of sexual intercourse between the husband and the wife. Sex should only ever be enjoyed between men, between a man and a woman, and then only in the freedom of marriage. Why? Because marriage and sex are a picture of Christ 
and the church. And the vehicle through which the promise of God was carried out. I said earlier on that marriage is for the picture and it was for the promise. Firstly, it pictures Christ and the church. Throughout the Bible, the relationship between God and his people is described as a marriage. In the Old Testament, God speaks about Israel as if she were his bride, often with references to, her, to Israel's unfaithfulness. In Jeremiah 3 verse 6, the Lord said, In the days of King Josiah, have you seen what she did, that faithless one, Israel? How she went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and there played the whore? Upon these mountains and under these trees where the idols of the other nations were. And going to these other idols instead of the Lord was an unfaithfulness in the marriage relationship between God and his bride. A couple of verses later, the Lord actually calls it adultery in Jeremiah. James uses the same language in the New Testament in his epistle in chapter 4 verse 4. When he speaks of worldly Christians, he says, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever would be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. It's through the prophet Hosea and the tragic failure of his marriage that we grasp the depth of the sinfulness of Israel's rejection of God's love. As Hosea's heart broke through the unfaithfulness of his wife, wife Goma, he learnt the depth of God's grief caused by Israel, his faithless spouse. And so what we see in the message in, in the prophet of Hosea is that it was not Israel's rejection of a moral or religious code that broke God's heart, but rather their rejection of love itself, God's love, because God loves his bride. He loves his bride. But the picture of, of, of marriage is not just used negatively of God and his people, but positively too. Uh, we'll get there in a, in a few weeks' time, but Revelation 19 speaks of Jesus' return. His return is gathering of his people, the bride that is the church. And we read there in 19, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. The church has been made ready by Christ offering those garments to her. Marriage is a picture of the gospel. Two parties enter into a covenant relationship and enjoy union. In earthly marriage, this is, a, is between two imperfect parties. An imperfect man and an imperfect woman, woman who make imperfect promises to one another and keep them imperfectly. Whose lives are bound together and displayed, that is displayed to one another in their sexual union. In the heavenly, divine marriage, it is between one perfect groom and his filthy, failing, faithless bride, who was meant to be a perfect bride before the fall, but who committed adultery with the devil and instead joined themselves to him, but who is now being cleaned and made ready by the sacrifice of the groom himself. We're going to get into this in two weeks' time. This is what marriage looks like, folks. It is a perfect marriage where the groom makes all the promises to the bride as their lives are bound together in Christ. All his eternal riches become hers and all her death and sin and dirt becomes his as he deals with it on the cross. Folks, that's what he's done for us. He's taken our sin and our shame on the cross and there he's killed it and he's paid for it. And he offers us his robes of righteousness. Marriage is the picture. It's the picture of the end point of the gospel and the way it was meant to be before Adam sinned. But as well as being the picture, marriage also became the delivery method of the promise of the gospel. No sooner had man fallen than God revealed the gospel. What Adam and Eve needed was a saviour. 
How would a saviour come to them? Through marriage. Genesis 3.15, we we get the, the gospel right there. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He, her offspring, will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is speaking of Christ who will come through the line of Adam, through the line of David, through Mary. Marriage was first necessary to fill the earth. Yes, but then it became even more necessary because it was through the bearing of children, through offspring, that Messiah would come. And let's be clear, let's be clear. Marriage is the only place, is the only route through which marriage should come. That is to say that the Bible says marriage is the only place for sex. We read, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife And the two shall become one flesh. Only then. They are no longer two, but one. It's only in marriage that there should be any one fleshing, guys. Okay? Sex is an incredibly precious and powerful thing. And not just because it's really good at selling cars and perfume. But because in sex, two become one. Two become one. There is a oneness achieved and experienced which is unlike any other earthly bond. And it pictures Christ's union with the church. It is the only thing on earth that can come close to describing what that union with Christ is like. Song of Songs is a fascinating book. And after Revelation, it's on mine and Rich's um, books we want to preach but not get fired list. Because Song of Songs is full of sexual imagery. It's about two lovers. And there's really no getting past that. But why is it in the Bible? Well, the same reason as every other book. To point us to Jesus. That's what we believe here. The sexual relationship between two lovers described in Song of Songs tells us something about Jesus' love for the church. Now... Some people get a little bit squeamish, uh, perhaps when we say things like that, to likening sex between a husband and a wife, to union between Christ and the church. But I would suggest that's because, if we do feel that, it's because we've allowed a worldly view to perverse our and distort our view of sex. Marital sex is a wonderful thing. It's not a dirty thing. It's pure. It's a gift that's been given to be enjoyed in marriage. It's about Jesus and the church. And Paul agrees in Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. He repeats here what's been said again. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, says Paul. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This is why why God cares so much about who's having it and how they're treating it. Because it's about Christ and the church. Sex is for marriage. And marriage is for sex. And you're all thinking, oh my goodness, when is the pastor going to stop talking about sex? Well, I'm done for now, at least until two weeks' time. Today we're looking at the theology of sex, and next time we'll consider the practice of sex. Now, either the, the place is going to be packed or empty in two weeks' time. No, we're going to be thinking about the theology of marriage, and next week, two weeks' time, we're thinking about the practice of marriage. Don't worry, it won't be explicit. So marriage is a God-ordained, one-flesh union between one man and one woman. And here's the last bit of the the theology of marriage that Jesus gives us. It's for life. Marriage is a God-ordained, one-flesh union between one man and one woman for life. Matthew 19, verse 6. So, there are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. The discussion of what ends a marriage can be a painful one. It's painful for many listening now here and and, and later on the recording. I know that. I understand that. And I acknowledge that there is serious debate and discussion among Christians as to what actually ends a marriage. And about what the Bible says about grounds for remarriage. And there not being a definite statement in our church constitution also allows for different views on the eldership. And so with that great big caveat, what I'm going to say now 
is very much the fruit of my own study in the scriptures. And some will disagree with me on it. And that's okay. Perhaps even some of the other elders. But there's room for movement on this. It's not bound in our constitution. Jesus says, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God joined together, let not man separate. We've just seen that this one flesh union that Jesus takes so seriously is this union, this picture of two people becoming one person, being, as the language implies here, inseparable, is a picture of the unbreakable union between Christ and the church. This is what it's a picture of. And being a picture of Christ and the church, Jesus therefore takes it very seriously. And he gives the command here, not to break the marriage bond. Don't break it. The Pharisees wanted to know how far they can go with their interpretation of Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. But Jesus re rejects their use of Deuteronomy, and instead he rejects their use and he raises the standard of marriage for his disciples to God's original intention in creation. He says that none of us should try to undo the one flesh relationship that God has created. Meaning that the only thing that should break the marriage relationship is, is death. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 39 says, A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she's free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. That means to another believer. Romans 7 verse 2 says, for a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. <laughs> marriage is a covenant for life. It is only ended by God in the sovereignly timed and, and painful death of one of the spouses. In Luke chapter 20, verse 34, here again the Pharisees are asking a question about the resurrection. And Jesus says to them in answering this question about what resurrection is going to be like, he says, the sons of this age, of here and now, are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy, who are called, elected, to attain to that age of the resurrection from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. So marriage is a covenant of this age. It's for here and now. It's for this life. Because, and because it serves to point to the marriage that will happen in the next age between Jesus and his people. Come the end of the age when Jesus returns for his bride, human marriage will be, one, no longer necessary for the reality will have replaced the shadow. And two, would be inappropriate and adulterous for we will be wed to christ and christ alone i know this is a hard thing and those of us who are married can't really think about what that might be like but we need to trust that heaven's going to be better than our marriage is death ends marriage that is the historic position of the church but the question is does anything else end marriage now of course we, we're reading here i mean the bible speaks of divorce doesn't it and we read that the Bible allows for divorce. God allows for divorce. But in verse 8, Jesus makes it clear that it's only because of the hardness of your hearts that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So while God allows divorce to break a marriage, several verses state that it does not end a marriage to the point that remarriage is called adultery. This is hard, I know. As Luke 16 verse 18 says, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Romans 7, 2 to 3, the continuation of that verse says, for a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. And the point is this. Marriage is meant to be for life. One, because it's what you promised to God when you were married. And two, 
because marriage is tied up with gospel truth. This is the importance that Jesus places on the marriage covenant. God is the covenant-keeping God, and he calls us as his people to be covenant-keeping people. And so three times in the New Testament, marriage is pronounced to be lifelong until death. Once it is commanded that a divorced person should remain unmarried, and five times remarriage after divorce is called adultery. This is a hard teaching. This is hard. And Jesus himself acknowledges that it's hard in verses 11 to 12 here. And his disciples, having heard all this, go, well, it's better not to be married than to be bound in a, in a marriage forever that we might be unhappy in. They understood what he's saying. And while there is one verse here in Matthew 19 that may looks like an exception clause, which seems to allow remarriage only in the cases of infidelity for the innocent party, even there, my view is that that one verse must be seen in the light of the weight of the other nine and not the other way around. And, and in any case, that verse, when we study it, isn't actually, I believe, talking about married people. It's a hard teaching. It's a hard view. But we must be held captive by Scripture. That's why I said at the beginning, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God has said. And we must make a study of these things. Anybody who's, who's struggling with that teaching this morning, please do come and speak to me. I was going to write a paper um, outlining the position that I've just given biblically but in doing my research I found a paper by John Piper he's written it much better than I could uh, oddly so I've got a few copies of this if you want to understand where I'm coming from uh, what the scriptures say please come I'd love to give you a copy of this if you want to study it further but wherever we land on this particular debate of whether remarriage is allowed in certain circumstances it is clear that marriage is meant to be for life it's meant to be for life We're going to get more into this in two weeks' time, but then as, we, as we round this up, we've got to ask, what does it matter? What does all of this matter? Marriage is a God-ordained, one flesh union between one man and woman, woman for life. And so the writer of the Hebrews says in chapter 13, verse 4, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Marriage is important. That is not to say that a married person is more valuable than an unmarried person, but that marriage is valuable, not just for the married person, but for the unmarried person too, and so must be held in honour by all, it says here, not just by those who are married. I dare say that the battle for marriage to be honoured by the world is gone. It's lost. But if we're not careful... Honour for marriage will be lost in the church too. We don't hold to what the Lord has said. We must guard against it by holding to Scripture. Marriage must be held in high honour by the church, which is why God gives clear qualifications regarding the marriages of church leaders and the need for them to be healthy. 1 Timothy 3, you're familiar with it, it talks about overseers, talks about elders. They must be above reproach of the husband of one wife, if they're married at all. He must manage his household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, and therefore implied his marriage, of course, how will he care for God's church? <coughs> Elders, pastors, leaders in the church must have healthy, reconciled marriages. Any pastor or elder must be able to manage his household. And if that household involves a wife, it means her living under his roof peaceably and recognizing his authority. If a wife will not recognize the authority of her husband, how can a church be expected to? Now, of course, no, no human marriage is perfect. Um, that is, perfection is not what is required. Otherwise, there would be no pastors or elders, believe me. But I would find it very difficult to stand up here this morning and say anything about marriage. And you would find it very difficult to take it from me saying anything about marriage if my marriage to Rachel was strained or breaking. How dare I? And pastors have to be able to preach on marriage. And so we need to be able to model it as well. 
The same is true when it comes to preaching the gospel, because marriage is a picture, a reflection of the gospel, and so the gospel minister must honour marriage, whether that be remaining in his unmarried condition with fidelity, or living in peace, order, and reconciliation with his own wife. So that ministers of the gospel can say along with Paul, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Marriage is important. We need to treat it the way God calls us to treat it. And to do that, we need to have a solid theology of marriage. We need to understand what the Bible says about it. The last thing, the very last thing I want to say on the subject of marriage is this. None of us are perfect. None of us honour marriage perfectly. And so we all need grace. Some of us will have had sex before marriage. Some of us will have had extramarital sex, adultery. Whether it be adultery with our bodies or even with our minds, Jesus says. Some of us have divorced a spouse. And some of us will have remarried on illegitimate grounds, whichever way we define that. We are all guilty of dishonouring marriage. But we're not beyond hope. We are not beyond receiving grace and receiving forgiveness if we repent of those sins. If you repent of the way that you have dishonoured marriage and desire to live in obedience to God's command for marriage, there is grace for you. There is forgiveness. Read through Ezekiel 16 this afternoon. Uh, it speaks of God's marriage to his people. It describes us in our sinful wretchedness. It describes us as a, as a discarded baby. It's cord still attached left in the open field. Nobody wants it. I'm going to read a few verses from it. And as for you, as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was, was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No, I pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you. But you were cast out in the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. But when I passed by you again and saw you, this is God speaking, Behold, you are at the age for love. He's already passed by once and brought life about in this child, but then he passes by and sees that you were in the a at the age for love, and I spread the corner of my garment over you, and I covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine, and I bathed you with water and washed off the blood from you, and I anointed you with oil, I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. Are you seeing this? And I adorned you with ornaments and I put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck and I put a ring on your, in your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. This is God's love in his marriage to us. God's marriage covenant to the church is not a marriage of duty but of love. We don't deserve his love for the reasons that we've talked about this morning and many, many more. We were not wanted by any. We don't deserve his love. We are not lovely. We are not faithful. And we do not love him well. Read later on in Ezekiel 16. Even though all of this has been poured on this child, they, she, she still goes off and, and plays the whore as it's put. And yet God remains steadfast in his love. This is God's love for us and for the church. Whatever mistakes we've made, God loves us. Turn to him, flee to him. In all of this, God gave his son Jesus that he might have us and that he may make us his own. Let our marriages be a picture of that unbreakable love. Amen.